All right, good evening everyone. Let us, let us begin. So we are picking up Emeritz Hashem this week in Kapitel Ayin Gimel. So we spent the last couple of weeks focusing on Megillah Asuros and then really coming, bringing all of that together, Baruch Hashem on the Yom Tov of Shavuos. Now jumping back a little bit into Sefer Tehillim. So we find ourselves tonight in Kapitel Ayin Gimel. So like many, very often when we begin a particular chapter, so we're not going to get very far in tonight's Kapitel. We're really just going to focus a little bit on the, on the opening phrase. So David HaMelech writes in Kapitel Ayin Gimel, Mizmar the Asaf, Ach Tov the Yisrael Elokim Levari Levav. So literal translation, a song of Asaf. We'll talk about that more in Mirat Hashem in coming weeks. Exactly who Asaf was, what, the, by the way, if anyone needs sheets, there are sheets uh, right up here if anyone needs. Who Asaf was, what role does Asaf play in this particular capital and tell him in general, we'll discuss. But that one is like this, a song of Asaf, truly God is good to Israel, to the pure of heart. So you'll take a quick look at the rest of the capital. I didn't put the English on because I wanted to get the uh, sources onto two pages. But the rest of the capital essentially, sp- essentially speaks about Cloud Israel's adversity, difficulty, challenges, right? Remember again, in Sefer Tehillim, you can pretty much divide up Sefer and Tehillim really into two different sections. There's where David Amalek speaks about incredible success, incredible happiness, incredible simcha and bracha, and where David Amalek speaks about adversity and difficulty and challenge and heartbreak and all of those things. So in this particular capital, David Amalek is speaking about difficulties, heartbreaks, adversity, but not per se on an individual level. The focus is much more on those thematic overtones on a national level. David HaMelech speaking about the suffering of Klal Yisrael. So it's interesting. So if we leave aside the Mizmar the Asaf, David HaMelech says, Achtov li Yisrael, it is good, right? Achtov li Yisrael Elohim. HaKadosh Baruch Hu is good to Klal Yisrael. Who is he good to? Lebare Levav. To those who are, now he's translating it over here as Bari Levav is pure of heart, but Bari Levav could also be healthy of heart. So Rashi says over here, and something very interesting in number two. Achtov Yisrael Okim, lefi she'inyan ha-mizmar medaber b'tzaros ha-ba'os al ovde ha-makom. So this entire capital is speaking about the suffering of Klav Yisrael. And in fact, this capital actually deals with perhaps what is, what is one of the most challenging theological concepts of Tzadik Veralo Rosho Vitovlo, but more focus on this first part of Tzadik Veralo. Why do bad things happen to good people? That's what David HaMelech is really lamenting, lamenting over the course of this particular capital. How could it be that Klal Yisrael, who follows in the ways of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Klal Yisrael who heeds the word of God, Klal Yisrael who is truly a light unto the nation, Klal Yisrael who always tries their best to become the best version of themselves, how is it that we suffer so much? That we suffer so much. I, you know, I, I, I think that one of the things that has been so shocking for us since October 7th is the notion of Jewish suffering. I think for many of us, for many of us, especially the, the younger amongst us, we don't know a world in which there is national Jewish suffering. Right? We, we might know personal suffering. I think we all know personal suffering. We all know personal adversity. But the concept, what happened on Simchas Torah, was for many of us the first time in our lifetime where we saw Klal Yisrael suffer. All right, if you're a little bit older, you were alive in 1967, a little bit older in 1948, right? So again, but assuming, assuming you're on the younger spectrum of, and I should say, age is a figment of imagination. Everybody's young. You understand my point, right? Your biological age I'm referring to, not how you feel. It's an incredible thing. It's the first time for many of us, I'll just speak for myself, first time in my life that I've ever seen Klaudi Yisrael suffer. You know, it's interesting, right? Because we've lived through so many terror attacks but the way, unfortunately, or fortunately, the way terror attacks work is the episode occurs, and then you move on, right? A day or two later, again, you're kind of just back to everything that was. And yet, again, here we are more than eight months after this terrible attack on Simchas Torah, and to a certain degree, we're still reeling from it. It's still, it's still overwhelming. Our hostages are still held captive. Our soldiers are still fighting battles on multiple fronts. So it's the, part of, I think, what's so shocking about it is it's the first time that many of us have ever lived through existential national suffering. We have never experienced this before in our lives, right? Anti-Semitism, we've all had our own particular, or perhaps we've all had our own particular encounters with anti-Semitism, but never in such a sustained, 
public fashion without any without any apologies and without even trying to cover it or mask it for what it is just pure vitriol and hatred so for us it's a new dynamic for our people it is not a new dynamic right concept of, of anti-semitism of hatred of suffering is as old as time itself and that's what this capital is lamenting so rashi number two says mizmar medaber this entire capital is talking about the suffering of cloud israel he says, "Lekach pasach bokach v'zel perusho af apisha ani tzoek umetama atzar asem shal Yisrael." So, Dara Malchus says, "It's Chesh Baruch Hu." To be honest, I don't understand why Jews suffer. This is Dara Malchus speaking. I don't understand why your people, why the chosen people, quote unquote, the chosen people, have to suffer. I don't understand it. Shani Tzoeg, I call out to you, Akadish Baruch Hu. I scream at you, Akadish Baruch Hu. And I wonder, why, why does this happen to us? Yadati ki Akadish Baruch Hu tov lahem. But yet I know that Akadish Baruch Hu is always good to us. Ulu tovasam hu mevi ale mesara kedei lezakosam lechaya olam abba. And that whatever suffering HaKadosh Baruch Hu brings upon us, ultimately, again, is only to purify us, to purge us, and to ready us for bliss in the world to come. So according to Rashi, and this is really incredible, I just want to point out so much of Tehillim, right, is like David HaMelech working through issues, right? The Piazhetsna speaks about this as well, that sometimes if there's something that you're having difficulty with, Piazhetsna writes, it's important, talk it out with yourself, with yourself, Talk it through. I mean, make sure other people aren't around. It might look a little bit strange, right? But 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 talk it. In other words, talk to yourself about yourself. Talk it through, and something amazing happens. Sometimes when you talk things out with yourself, you're able to gain a level of clarity. So much of Sefer Tehillim is David Amelech talking through his own issues. So here you have it. Says Rashi, what's happening in this capital? David Amelech doesn't understand why is there so much suffering. Why do the righteous suffer? Why does Cloud Yisrael always seem to be on the receiving end of such hate, of such vitriol, of such suffering? So Daniel Tal says, and I, I yell at Kaddish Baruch for it. I scream at Kaddish Baruch for it. I don't understand it. But yet David Amal says, with all of that, I also know that a Kaddish Baruch is good to us, and it is for our good that he brings this suffering upon us. Now, in this one little Rashi, and this one little piece, lies the incredible power and beauty of the Jew. See, to the rest of the world, this statement sounds inherently contradictory, and two things can't be true, right? Like, for example, if I tell you that it's day, right, and then I also tell you it's night, could both of those statements be true? Could it be day and be night? Right? So you could write, first of all, you could write two different time zones. If I were to tell you outside, it's day and it's night. It's day and it's night. Is it possible for both to be true? So tell you something interesting. For Jews, it is. Well, now, what do I mean by that? I'll even explain this to you in, in a halachic context. In a halachic context, there's something called shkia, shkia sunset. And then there's seisa kochavim, which is nightfall. There's a period of time between shkia and seisa kochavim called ben ashmashos. What's the status of Ben Hashmashos? Is it night or is it day? And the answer is, it's a machlokas. It's a machlokas. So to a certain degree, it's a time of day that takes on both qualities. I've always thought that Ben Hashmashos is the most incredible metaphor for like the theology of the Jew. That we could live in night and day simultaneously. In the rest of the world, you ask them, could it be night or day at the same time? The answer is a resounding no. The Jew is it night or day? Yes, yes. It could actually be both simultaneously. And that's what's happening in this capital, according to Rashi. David HaMelech, David HaMelech is saying, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, I'm yelling at you for the suffering. I'm yelling at you because I'm angry at you. I, I, I'm, I'm hurt by the suffering that you visit upon your people. As individuals, in this particular context, it's as a nation. But I also know everything is motivated out of love that even when you patch us, you hug us even harder. And even when you punish us, it's only for our ultimate good. And even when it hurts so badly, it is only there because you are paving the way for something beautiful that is about to come about, that is about to actualize. It could be day and it could be night all at the same time. And that's why, according to Rashi, that's the Ravana Chasing over here. Asaf, Mizmar Asaf. By the way, you also begin to see Asaf means what? Asaf means what? 
Sorry? Addition. Addition that could also mean? To gather. Right? So it's almost as if, what is David HaMelech doing over here? What is he doing? He's gathering, right? He's gathering all of the disparate or all of the seemingly contradictory emotional experiences into one. Mizmar the Asaf. You could bring day and night together. You could bring suffering and salvation together. You could be bring pain and joy together. He says, Achtov li Yisrael Elokim lebari levav. Now, but the only way to bring this together is how? The only way to bring this together is how? Is if you have a strong and healthy heart. What does it mean to have a strong and healthy heart? You have to possess emuna. And what kind of emuna, what kind of belief are we talking about? The belief that says that everything comes from the See, let me take a step back. Every major religion deals with the same essential theological crisis, which is how do you explain the suffering of the righteous? So one of the easy ways that certain religions deal with it is to create a separate theological power for good and theological power for evil. So there's a God and there's a devil, right? And the devil kind of has like a little bit of his, or Satan almost has, which is different than our Satan, right? He has like his own power, his kind of like his own portfolio. He can do stuff. So that's actually theologically convenient. Then when something bad happens, oh no, no, don't get God involved in it. It's not God. It's not God. It's Satan or it's some other deity, right? In everything... Understand what motivates polytheistic religions. What motivates polytheistic theology is the inability to reconcile disparate forces in the world and the inability to understand how one entity could be the source of good and bad. So instead, just farm it out. There's a God for this, and there's a God for this, and there's a deity for this, and there's a deity for that. And it's convenient. It's theological, theologically convenient, because now I know there are gods that love me, and there are gods that Like, you know, you see this, like, like in Greek mythology, right? There were the Greek, there were the gods that sympathized with the plight of, of men, and then there were gods who were just out to get men. And it's so much easier to walk around theologically like that, because now there's no contradiction. There's just different gods. In Yiddishkeit, the hardest thing that we try to bring together is there's only one HaKadosh Baruch Hu, which means that everything comes from Him. But if everything comes from Him, that also means that everything somehow, some way, must be for the good. You know, Gamzu Latova, I, I mentioned this many times, Gamzu Latova is a, is a theologically abused concept. What do I mean by that? Gamzu Latova is, I remember when my kids were little, who sang the Gamzu Latova song? Uncle Maishi, okay, right, so, so Uncle Maishi, Aviva is a closet Uncle Maishi fan, I just want to, right, right, so Uncle Maishi, I think it was Uncle Maishi, has like, and you know how like, everybody has this Gamzula Tova song where usually the way it goes is like this, it's a guy who's a complete shlemiel, right, and nothing goes right for him in life, and every single time something goes wrong, he says, oh, Gamzula Tova, right? like, like, like Gamzula Tova is what you say when you're an absolute nebuch, nothing is going well, you're a big failure, but you want to sound from. So you just say, okay, I'm not angry at God, it's Gamzula Tova, like Fashlepzach, you know, Gamzula Tova. Gamzula Tova is one of the most powerful theological affirmative statements. And what it says is, it's not like a, Okay, this is really terrible, but Gamzula Tova. Gamzula Tova says, every, I believe with all of my heart. Oh, something, okay. I believe with everything. Oh, okay. I believe with everything in my heart that ultimately everything comes from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So if everything comes from HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the Rebbe is the source of all good, which means even the things that hurt so badly and so profoundly, they're good. But you really only believe it if you have the amuna, and you need to have the amuna in order to believe it, so we get stuck in a little bit of a, 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 a little bit of a cycle. You need the amuna to believe it, but you need to believe it in order to have the amuna. So that says Rashi is what David Amalek is saying over here. David Amalek is about to launch into an exhaustive diatribe about the suffering of Cloud Yisrael and how he's somewhat resentful of Hakadosh Baruch Hu. Not resentful is the wrong word. Angry at HaKadosh Baruch Hu for the suffering that has been visited upon the people. But yet, how does he start off before he even gets into all the suffering? Mizmah the Asaf. Here's what we're going to do over here. Davana says, Chavra, we're bringing together all the disparate pieces. Ach tov li Yisrael lelokim. HaKadosh Baruch Hu only does good for Klal Yisrael. Sometimes the good feels good, and sometimes the good hurts more than anything. But it's all good. But there's only one catch. Levare levav. You have to have a healthy heart. And in this case, it's not about your cholesterol, right? Healthy heart over here is talking about, again, 
your emuna. If you have emuna, and you know, one of the difficult parts about emuna, we'll talk about this a little bit in the rest of the shir, is emuna sometimes, it sounds strange to say, like you could work on your emuna, right? You could grow your emuna, but like that first, I call it like nugget of emuna, you just have to have it. You just have to like accept it. You just have to buy into it. Then you could build off it. But you're not going to learn a safer that's going to give you emuna. You could learn Sfarim that'll help grow your emuna, amplify your emuna. But emuna is a decision that you make. I decide to put my complete trust and belief in HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Now you're a Baal or Baal es emuna. Now once you have that, you could build on that foundation. So David HaMalach says, you got to have emuna. Without emuna in life, you have nothing. Without emuna in life, life is an overwhelming, difficult, challenging experience filled with often more downs than ups, more trials and tribulations than successes, and it is easy to drown in the sea of the human condition. But if you have emuna, and that most basic core of emuna, if you believe that everything that HaKadosh Baruch Hu does is good, then ultimately you could keep your head above water no matter what happens in life. That's according to Rashi. Truth is, it's enough for a shia right there. That's Rashi. But take a look at the Medrash number three. The Medrash writes, Medrash goes in a little bit of a different direction. He says, Achtov li Yisrael elokim. He says, Yisurin shehevi aleim tovim heim. The suffering that Echash Baruch brings upon Klal Yisrael is good. Is good. Now, again, what, 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 is that, what does that mean? Suffering is good. So like we said before, remember, if we believe that everything that HaKadosh Baruch Hu does is for the good, and ultimately to bring us to an ultimate good, to an ultimate good, just the pathway to ultimate good is paved with different experiences. Sometimes the pathway to good is paved with beauty and easy and easiness and fantastic bracha, and other times the pathway to good ultimately is paved with incredible difficulty and adversity. I'll just mention, just as an aside, Rabbi Levi Yitzhak so the Rebbe says in the brach of Avos in Shmona Esrei, Shmona Esrei. So the Rebbe says, what do we say in Avos? Elokei Avram, Elokei Yitzchak, Velokei Yaakov. So why do we make mention of the Avos, right? Why do we start Shmona Esrei with the Avos? So there's a variety of different answers. Levi Yitzchak explains because each of the Avos had a different relationship with Hakadosh Baruch Hu, and therefore each of them really highlighted or personified a different attribute of God, right? Avram Avinu really brought to the world the God of Chesed, the God of kindness. Yitzchak Avinu brought to the world the God of strict justice, the God who sometimes demands that you place yourself on the altar of life. Yaakov Avinu, Yaakov Avinu kind of brought into this world a little bit of a combination, the God of Chesed and the God of strict justice. So Lady Yitzchak says something incredible. We start the bracha of, of Shemona with Avos to teach us that we see different images of HaKadosh Baruch Hu as we go through life, right? I think we all experience this. Sometimes you're in life and you're like, God is good. God is good, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, right? My cup runneth over. I have, I have everything and anything that I want. And then other times, God is dealing with me really difficultly. Really, and by the way, there's nothing wrong with saying that. And there's nothing wrong with acknowledging it. And there's nothing wrong with even bemoaning it a little bit or being upset with it a little bit or wondering why this is happening to me. And the incredible part is so the baby says, how do we end the bracha of Avos? How do we end it? Baruch Hashem, Magen Avram. Why do we end that way? To teach us that no matter what path I'm on, the path of chesed or the path, or the path of din, there's only one purpose for every single path, and that is Magen Avram, for the chesed of Hashem to come out. HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants us to be happy. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants to shower bracha. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants to give us beautiful and good and rewarding lives. Just sometimes the way to get there is through Avram. And sometimes the way to get there is through Yitzchak. But the destination is always the same. It's always to bring out bracha in life. So the Medrash writes over here number three. He says, Even the suffering that Hashem brings upon us is good. You know, I, again, we have to get to our topic, but, but I, I'll just mention, it's just so interesting to point out, you know, you see these words in the Medrash, can I ask you, when you see these words, Yisurin Shevi Alem Tovim, the suffering that Hashem brings upon us is good. How, how does that phrase make you feel? Do you agree with that phrase? 
Do you ever, have you ever in your life felt that phrase? See, this is a group of righteous women, so nobody wants to admit it. I'll be, I'll be the guy, right? So again, no, no, suffering's not good. Suffering is terrible. Suffering is horrible. In fact, when it occurs, I will do anything to try. So what do you mean? What do you mean? Yisurin shehevi aleim tovim heim. So we sometimes have this very skewed theological view of suffering. And, we, and by the way, when I say suffering, suffering is very relative. Right? People suffer in different ways. Some people, they don't like their job, they're suffering. They have health problems, they're suffering. They have shalom bayis problems, they're suffering. And again, you know, the worst thing you could ever do when it comes to suffering is try to, what's the right word, like, um, categorize someone's suffering. You ever have a conversation with someone where you tell them something you're struggling with and they minimize your try. You know there are children starving in Africa, right? Like, you know, like, I got it. I, I, I know that there are children starving in Africa. I understand that and I feel terrible about that. But that doesn't change the fact that I'm having a really difficult time in life. Or for that matter, again, when you're struggling with some, some, something and someone tries to give you like the positive spin on it. Oh, don't, don't, it's, it's going to be great. It's going to be this. They call that toxic positivity. Right? Toxic positivity means there are people who just like, they think it is their job to be the ray of sunshine and everything else. And meanwhile, all you want to tell them is two words. What are the two words? Shut up. Shut up. Please. Please. I pre... Chama, you are not allowed to say that word. And it's like, hey, 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 I, 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 know, I know what you're trying to say. I know what you're trying to do. I know what you're trying to do. But just stop. Just stop. We have sometimes like this, this flawed theological that I'm supposed to get to the level where like I'm suffering. I'm saying, oh, thank you. Thank you. My whole life I've been waiting to suffer. My whole life finally it's here. Thank you for the suffering. Thank you for the adversity. There are tzaddikim like that who, who are able to rejoice in suffering. There are people like that. That's not regular normal people. Regular normal people when they suffer, only thing they want is to get out of their suffering. That's what they want. I want it to be over. So what does it mean when the Medrash says? It means that the tzaddikim know that even though the suffering hurts now and it's terrible and I want to get out of it now, at the end of the day, I recognize that it's for my ultimate good. It's for my ultimate good. Now look what he writes. Ulumi. But who, who is able to reach this level of where they're able to go through suffering, they're able to go through difficulty, and they're literally able to actually believe that somehow this is for the good. Either that the suffering itself somehow will turn into something good or that the suffering is paving the way for good. Who is able to do this? Lebare levav. Now what does it mean lebare levav? Levarer es libam shel tzadikim. So this phraseology is actually quite interesting. Levarer es libam shel tzadikim. Levarer means to clarify. To clarify. I think what the Medrash is saying like this. Suffering has the ability to clarify and to strengthen our resolve. How do you know when you're really committed to something? Right? How do you know when you are fully, fully connected and committed to something? It's only when you're challenged. Right? In other words, if I'm doing something in life, and at the end of the day, I just do it day in and day out, and there's no struggle, there's no friction, there's no opposing force. So the truth is, I don't know if I'm really committed or not. Real commitment only comes about in times of suffering. The Medrash is saying is like this, according to Medrash, the Dover is saying like this, when is it that you're able to make a declarative theological statement that I know that this suffering ultimately will bring me to something good? Or I believe that somehow, I, I believe that everything that HaKadosh Baruch Hu does is for good. It's only when you undergo suffering. Only through adversity do you have the ability to clearly, uh, to, 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 to clarify or to strengthen your resolve. Suffering tests our faith and either breaks it or makes it stronger. Says, says the Medrash, that's the Pshat, Libare Levav, Levare Levav. Suffering has the ability to test your resolve, to test who and what you are. You really only get to know the real you under adversity. And the truth is, anyone who's ever undergone adversity knows that this statement is one million percent true. If you haven't had it battle tested in life, Zachis, wonderful, you're very lucky. But I mean, it happens to all of us. And it's interesting, because when you suffer and undergo adversity, it's interesting to see the things that fall away and the things that you hold on to. 
And those things that you hold on to, those are really the things you believe in. Those are really the things you're connected to. The things that fall away, those are often the very things that you really never had that much commitment to to begin with. So two very different versions, that's what David HaMelech is saying over here. According to Rashi, according to Rashi, David HaMelech is saying we need to work on Amuna, And we need to work on Amuna when things are good. And Amuna on a most basic level means everything that comes from HaKadosh Baruch Hu is good. Either good now or will be good in the future. And if you have that, and if you have that, then ultimately again you'll be able to see the good in everything that occurs in life. Medjish, that's not what David HaMelech is saying. I mean, it is what David HaMelech is saying, but he's adding on something additional, which is the power of suffering is that it strengthens your resolve. The power of suffering, and when I say suffering, by the way, suffering sounds like a very, a very heavy word. Adversity, adversity. The power of adversity is that it tests, thank you, it tests your resolve. What are you committed to? What are the things that are really part of you? And what are the things that are not so part of you? So I thought what was fascinating about this concept is, you know, one of the exciting things, uh, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to give this year, but one of the things that I always found interesting is like, you know, we're, we're going, we've been doing Safer Tillam for many years. It is always fascinating to me to see a, a tremendous hashkacha when there's an intersect between the capital we're learning and the parasha. So I want to show you something amazing. Take a look at number four. So this week's parasha, parasha shlach, because I think we see the same exact theme in the parasha. So from a little bit of context, Parsha Shlach the Meraglim. Moshe Rabbeinu sends the spies. I mean, Cloud Yisrael sends the spies. Moshe Rabbeinu gives in to, gives in to the request. So what happens? Number four. Fine. So go ahead and send the spies. One representative per tribe. That's the way, that's the way the Miraglim worked. Okay. Number five. So each tribe had their own appointed guy. So Pasik says in number five. So Yoshua was the representative of Shevet Ephraim. Shevet Ephraim. So, so Moshe calls over Yoshua before he sends him out and he changes his name. Changes his name from Hoshea to Yehoshua. As in an extra yod. Why does he do this? So everyone's familiar with the famous Rashi number six. So Rashi understands over here that this, so according to Rashi, Moshe Rabbeinu had a tremendous foreboding sense of doom about this mission about this mission. You know, I think every parent could relate to this a little bit. There are times like your child wants to do something and you absolutely know they shouldn't do it. But you can't say no. You have to let them do it. But you know, you could script, you know, exactly probably because you did the same thing when you were a kid, right? So, so I know exactly what's going to happen. Exactly it's it's going to blow up in their face. But I have, so most Rabbi knows this, this whole thing is a bad idea. This, there's nothing positive that's going to come out of this. But what are you supposed to do? If Moshe Rabbeinu says no, then what's the problem? What's the problem? They're going to think that he's hiding something, right? You, oh, you don't want us to see it? Right? You, what, what's the expression? You want us to buy it, you know, sight unseen? You know, you just, you, that's it. You just want us. So Moshe Rabbeinu says, so it's kind of like, I, I, I'm, I'm doomed if I do and doomed if I don't. In other words, if I let them go, it's going to be bad. If I don't let them go, they're going to think I'm hiding something. So instead, okay, go. But it's, it's incredible. And like in that moment before he dispatches the he pulls over Yoshua. He says, for now on, your name is not Hoshea, but Yoshua. I'm adding an extra Yud. Why extra Yud? Rashi number six. Vaikram Hoshea Hoshea. Hispal alav ka Yoshiacha me'atzas meraglim. He davened, Hashem should save you from the council of the spies. Moshe Rabbeinu, again, has this, has this foreboding feeling that things are just really going to go badly. And therefore, again, adds in the extra yud, like a little additional siyata deshmaya, Hashem should save you from the terrible counsel of the spies. Just as an aside, by the way, Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky, Zechatat Levrach, and Sefer Amos Yaakov number 7, asks an interesting question. Remember, all of these men were righteous men. I want to be clear. We know sometimes we look at people, we judge people based on the end of the story. Everybody has their bad moments in life. The Meraglam had their bad moments, but they were, they were tzaddikim. They were righteous men, at least in the beginning. So Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky asks, he says, Yoshua wasn't the only leader. What about Kalev? Kalev ben Yefuna, right? Kalev also goes ahead and... Kalev also goes to the Meraglim. Why didn't Moshe add on a letter to Kalev's name, giving him additional divine strength as well? So if you look at number seven, so Why didn't Moshe daven for Yoshua? 
Very sorry for Kalev. Look what he says. The Efsha Shasavar Moshe She Kalev Shahaya Nasui Li Isha Tzadekis Kimo Miriam Hanavia Betach Lo Yitvas Ba'atas Miragal and Veino Zaka Klebracha. Such a beautiful idea. Moshe Rabbeinu didn't have to give Kalev a bracha. Why not? Because Kalev had a good wife. Who was his good wife? Who was his wife? Miriam. Right? Kali ben Yifuna was married to Miriam. Was married to Miriam. So ultimately, again, it's incredible. So Moshe Rabbeinu felt, and it was Moshe Rabbeinu's sister, I know my sister. If my sister is your wife, she's going to give you all the Musr you need, right? She's going to give you all the Siyat the Shmaya you need. You're not going to make a mistake when you are married to a woman like So such a, just as an aside, just a beautiful, beautiful insight into the power of, of, power of positive marital dynamics. But just an interesting, just an aside. So therefore, Moshe Avinu goes ahead and gives this extra Yud to Yoshua. So first approach of Rashi, first approach of Rashi, is that Moshe Rabbeinu has this foreboding sense of gloom about what it is that's about to happen, adds in the extra Yud, Hashem should save you from the council of the spies. Take a look at number eight. The Yerushalmi gives a different approach. Number eight. The Yerushalmi writes, Rav Huna b'shem Rabbi Achai, Yud shenot l'akadosh baruch hu sara. This is incredible. The Yerushalmi understands this wasn't just any regular Yud. This wasn't a regular Yud. The Yud came from somewhere. Where did the Yud come from? It came from Sarai's name. So remember again, Sarai Imenu started out as Sarai, and she becomes Sarah. What happened to her Yud? What happened to her Yud? So, so what happens? When it, so the so Gemara says like this. When HaKadosh Baruch Hu changed Sarai's name to Sarah, number eight, end of the first line, Allah Yud v'nishtatach l'tnei HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So the Yud from Sarai, Kiviyachol, went and prostrated itself before Hashem. The Yud came, the Yud came before HaKadosh Baruch Hu and complained, Va'amar, ribono ha'olamim, akartani minat tzadekes hazos. So the Yud said, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, what did you do to me? What did you do to me my whole life? I've been part of Sarai. My whole life I've been part of the life of this tzadekes. Now you removed me from her. Now literally I'm a Yud without a home. I'm a Yud without a name. I'm a Yud without an identity. What's going to be with me? Amar HaKadosh Baruch Hu, tzei l'cha, l'sha'avra ha'yisa b'sof teva, so HaKadosh Baruch Hu says to the Yud, don't worry about it. I'm going to attach you even to a different great person. And you're even going to have more prominence. Because for Sarai, you're at the end of her name. I'm going to put you at the beginning of a name. And the name ultimately, again, that the Yud is attached to is the name of Yoshua. The name of Yoshua. So therefore, the Gemara has this beautiful idea that somehow the Yud of Sarai becomes the very Yud of, that transforms Hosea to Yoshua. All right, so this is very beautiful, but what, what, is, what, is it, what does it mean? What does it mean that the Yud of Sarai is coming to Yoshua? So if you look at number nine, in the Aznaim Torah, Rav Zam Saraskin, who was the Rav of Lotsk, writes as follows. He's, this is so beautiful. He writes over here, skip down a little bit, skip about in, in the right-hand column, four lines are from the bottom. But Sarachiyun, Lama Bachru Bahosheya Benun Lahosif Loas Hayud. So I understand, right? The Gemara is saying the Yud is all upset because it was taken from Sarai and now it's nameless, it's homeless. Sechash Baruch says, don't worry, I'm going to put you somewhere great. He puts the Yud with Yoshua. Why Yoshua? Why Yoshua? Why not, why not someone else? Why not somewhere else? So this is so beautiful. He says, V'yishlomar, She'al yedei she'shinu es shma min Sarai l'sara, no'lad la Yitzchak. Remember again, when Sarai becomes Sarah, that's when she has the ability to conceive. And she has Yitzchak. V'ad yechavtza Hashem, sh'yirish es kol eretz Yisrael, u'kimosh amal Avram. And remember again, what was the destiny, right? Avram Avinu's ultimate destiny, which is actualized through Yitzchak and then Yaakov afterwards, is what? Inheritance of Eretz Yisrael. Right? From the beginning. Lech lecha ela aretz asher areka. And Hashem who says, that land is going to become yours. The birth of Yitzchak Avinu, represented the actualization or the beginning of the fulfillment of the promise that Hashem made to Avram Avinu to give the descendants of Avraham Eretz Yisrael. Without, before Yitzchak, there were no descendants or no descendants from Avram and Sarah. Now that there is a descendant, there's someone to give the land to. Shiyash is called Eretz Yisrael, K'mo Shalom Avram, K'lo Yirash ben Amar Azos in B'ni Yitzchak. U'milo Yichev Tzazeh, Nintzor Yoshua. Who was the one? who led Klal Yisrael into Eretz Yisrael to inherit the land, who was it? Yoshua. So therefore the Hazanah Torah has such a beautiful idea. So therefore the Yud, now the Yud had to leave Sarai. The Yud had to leave Sarai so that Sarai could become a Sarah, could become pregnant and give birth to a Yitzchak. 
a Yitzchak was the one who was going to be the beginning of the fulfillment of the reception of Eretz Yisrael as our destiny, as our homeland. So the Yud left Sarai so that the Yerusha of Eretz could begin. And where does it settle? With Yoshua. With Yoshua, who ultimately leads us. So it's incredible. So essentially, what the Zaman Torah is saying is such a beautiful idea that Sarah is the beginning of the circle and Yoshua is the end. Yeshua is the end. Sarah was the one who brought life into this world, an heir to Avram, so that Eretz Yisrael could be vested within us, and Yeshua is the one who adds, who brings us in. So the Yud taken from Sarai, which represents the old Sarai, couldn't have a Yitzchak, now becomes a Sarah, that Yud comes to Yeshua as he readies himself to be the leader who enters us in, who brings us into Eretz Yisrael. Such a beautiful idea, it's a mag magnificent idea. But I think we can take it just one step further, this connection between Yoshua and Sarah. And maybe there's something even more that's unfolding over here. If you take a look at number 10, just going back in time a little bit, embracious, embracious. So remember again, we know the story, and it's a heartbreaking story. The Sarai Eshes Avram lo yoldolo, the lo shivcha mitzvis ushmahagar. Sarah couldn't conceive. Sarah, Sarai couldn't conceive. Sarai understood that there had to be a future to the Abrahamic destiny. She has a maidservant, a woman by the name of Hagar. Fatomar Sarai El Avram, Hine Atsarani Hashem Iladas. Hashem has obviously withheld me from, from giving birth. Bo Noah Shivchasi, Ulai Ibanami Mena. So marry my right, go ahead and conceive with my maidservant. Perhaps I will be built up through her. Vaishma Avram le calls Sarai, and Avram listened to Sarai. Vatikach Sarai Eishes Avram as Hagar a mitzvah shivchasa miketz eser sharon l'sheves Avram be'aretz kenan. Excuse me, Vatite also the Avram Isha lowly Isha. Sarai, the wife of Avram, takes Hagar the Egyptian, her maidservant, at the end of ten years, ten years after they were in Eretz Yisrael in Eretz Kenan, and she gives Hagar to Avram as a wife. So the Ramban says in number 11, there is so much that is unfolding and so much to be unpacked in these psukim. Look at the Ramban writes. So first of all, the Ramban writes over here, he points out, this is just an interesting aside, the incredible marriage that Avram and Sarah had. That Avram, if you notice, by the way, it's interesting, this was not Avram's idea. Right? Taking Hagar was not his idea. He never suggested it. He never alluded to it. Avram never said, to, there was no recorded conversation with Sarai about who, what's going to happen? We're not having children. There's no conversation. But Salavichik points out, it's almost as if, it's almost as if Avram Avinu understood that he had something beautiful in his companionship with Sarah. If it produced children, it didn't produce children. That, that wasn't what Avram Avinu was thinking. That wasn't, this was not his suggestion. This was all Sarai's suggestion. And as such, the Ramban points out over here that if you notice, by the way, after Sarai goes ahead and makes a suggestion, she says, right, marry Hagar. So if you notice, the positive says, Vatikach Sarah Eishes Avram as Hagar. So even after Sarai said, do this, Avram is not the one who takes action. It's Sarai who brings Hagar to Avram. Avram almost does not have an interest in doing this. Avram's interest is in one person, and that's his wife. That's Sarai. That's why, by the way, just as an aside, we know, Rabbi Salvechik points out that after, after Sarah dies, at the end of Parashat, beginning of Chai Sarah, we find no more dynamic activity on the ha behalf of Avram Avinu. Right? The only thing Avram Avinu dies after Sarah, after Sarah dies is he finds a wife for Yitzchak. But the Avram Avinu, who is traveling all over the place, right, going here, going there, always on his theological soapbox, spreading the word of God, stops after his partner dies there's a huge part of him that dies as well so the Ramban says first of all the incredible sensitivity that Avram has to Sarai he's not suggesting taking another wife he's not suggesting going in and taking the maidservant what will be with children that's up to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. God will figure it out it's not it's not it's not our problem it's HaKadosh Baruch Hu's problem that he has to figure out a way to bring us offspring for the actualization of our of our of our destiny but look at paragraph base now this is incredible the Hiskia Kosov. I mean, eleven Bay's second line. The Hiskia Kosov. Sarai Eches Avram. So, if you notice, by the way, the Ramban points out, in this whole time, Sarai is always referred to as Eches Avram, the wife of Avram. Now, that's redundant and repetitive, right? So, we don't. We we know who Sarai is. We've already been talking about her for a while. We know that she's the wife of Avram. So, why does it have to highlight that she's the wife of Avram? And the Ramban says something amazing. Not only that, the Ramban points out, but remember. Sarai could have given Hagar to Avram 
as a pilegesh, right? In, in halacha, there's two concept, constructs of marriage. There's a wife and there's a concubine, a pilegesh, without getting into all the differences, but there are halachic differences, ksuva differences, all different kinds of differences. He could have given, she could have given Hagar to Avram as a pilegesh, but she doesn't. If you look at the Pasuk, the Pasuk says, she gives Hagar to Avram li'isha, as a wife, as a wife. So it's not just that she's introducing another woman into their marriage in order to, to conceive and have children. She's telling Avram, you need to marry this woman. There needs to be ishos, there needs to be marriage. She needs to be a wife, just like I'm a wife, she needs to be a wife. Says the Ramban something absolutely amazing. She says, what's the pshat? Second line, paragraph base. He says, l'rames, ki sara lo nisya'asha me'avram, v'lo herchika atzma me'etzla. Do you want to know the greatness of Sari Imenu? Sari Imenu was so committed to a vision, was so committed to a destiny, that even when it became painfully apparent to her that what she wanted more than anything was not going to happen, she didn't abandon ship. So Sari Imenu was an older woman already. So as far as she's concerned, she is not having children. And she almost accepts that fact. That's it. By the way, remember again, later on, when she finds out that she's going to have children, what does she do? What does she do? Yeah. She laughs. Right? So everyone thinks it's a laugh of disbelief. It's not that Sarah didn't believe. It's that, you know how like sometimes you want something really badly and then you put it out of your mind. That it's, it's just, it's never going to. And you make, you make your peace with that. You make your peace with that. And then when someone brings it up again, you're like, it's ridiculous. You know, not, this, not that I don't believe it could happen, but like, we, we did that already. We did that. I, I closed the chapter on that. I closed the book on that. Sarah Imenu, and it's just understand the profundity over here. She recognizes here, she left, remember, Sarai left her life, left her family, left everything back in Haran. She followed her husband. Where did she follow her husband to? Where did she follow him to? Remember again, at first, she has no idea. Because Avram has no idea, right? Hashem says, Avram, lech lecha, ela aris, asher areka. I'll tell you when you need to know. And can you imagine that conversation? Honey, you know, excellent dinner tonight. Thank you so much. By the way, we've got to pack up the stuff. We're going, right? We're, we're moving, right? Relocating. Great. Where? Not sure, right? Do you have any idea? God said he's going to show us. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Like, 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 the emuna the, the that you have to have. Avram, at least, was the one who spoke to God. Okay. So one thing you hear from God directly. Okay. I understand. You talk to God and God says, go. You go. Sorry, didn't speak to God. So I spoke to Avram, who spoke to God, a step removed. She was so committed to the vision, but the vision, the vision, the actualization of the Abrahamic destiny was fundamentally tethered to an heir. There had to be children. There had to be offspring. If there wasn't offspring, that what happens with all of the divine promises? And all of this time, Sarah Imenu assumes, okay, Hashem is going to make it happen. He's going to make it happen. He always makes it happen. We're the chosen couple. So he's going to make it happen. And in this moment, Sarai says, it's not, it is going to happen. But it's not going to happen through me. It's not going to happen through me. But I am, Sarai says, I am so committed to the vision. I am so committed to the theological ideal that I am not going to give up and I am going to bring it about one way or another. So what does she do? she introduces Hagar. And here's what's incredible. She says, Avram, you need to do this. Avram, not interested. Avram, you need to do this. There's a vision. There's something we have to accomplish. We have to be the parents of a nation. We wanted it to happen a certain way. It's not going to happen that way. We have to pivot because we need to bring about the actualization of our personal and national destiny. Avram says, fine. And if you're Avram, you're probably figuring, okay, she's going to be a Pilega, she's going to be a concubine. No, no, no. That's not how a people is built. A people is not built with Pilagshos. It's not built with concubines. It's built with wives. So if you're going to take her, if you're going to bring her into our home, I'm going to bring her into our home, it is going to be as a full-fledged wife. This is going to be done bikdusha ubitara. We are committed to a vision. We are committed to a destiny. We are committed to a future. And no matter how difficult it becomes, we are not giving up. He goes on, he says, Ki hi ishto vehu isha. Sarah says to Avram, just because we can't have what we wanted together the way we wanted to have it, I am still your wife. You are still my husband. And we are still the partners in the actualization of this destiny. It's going to happen a different way. But I'm not giving up. 
and you're not giving up. So what is Ramban highlighting? Do you want to know the greatness of Sari Menu? The incredible greatness of Sari Menu was an unequivocal commitment to the actualization of a destiny, of a vision, of a future. Would anyone have blamed Sarah if after an additional 10 years, after an additional 10 years of infertility, she would have said, you know what? I'm going home. I'm going home. I, I, I'm, I'm going back to my family. I'm going back to Haran. Like, I, I followed you. I, I was all about the God stuff, right? The Shabbaton was great. It was fantastic, very inspiring. I, th this, is, this is too difficult. This is just not what I signed up for. I didn't sign up for a nomadic life without even just the most basic ability to build a family. No one would have faulted Sarah if she just decided to pack it up and go home. But the greatness of Sarah Imenu was a singular commitment to a vision. I believe in what we're building and I believe in it so much that no matter how difficult it becomes, I am not giving up now come back. So now Sarai, Sarai's name is changed to Sarah. And remember again, by the way, a lot of other things make sense also. Remember again, Avram, so Sarah tells Avram, Garishas ben Amazos, you have to kick Yishmael out of the house. See, you know, it's easy to read those psukim and saying, oh, okay, I got it. Sarah favored her kid over Hagar's kid. That's not it. That's not it. Sarah says to Avram, we have a job to do. There is a mission, there is a vision. Yitzchak has to be the next of the patriarchs. I can't raise a patriarch in a home with Yishmael. Dedication to a vision comes with difficult choices. You have to ask Yishmael to leave. You have to ask him to leave. It wasn't that she had wanted her son favored. Same dedication to a vision. So now the Yud of Sarai comes before HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And the Yud says, I'm nameless, I'm homeless, where am I going? comes Moshe Rabbeinu and grabs that yud from Sarai and who does he give it to? He gives it to Yoshua. And the bracha he gives to Yoshua is like this, Yoshua, we are about to seize our destiny of Eretz Yisrael. And I'm going to tell you exactly what's going to happen. I can't tell you exactly how it's going to happen, but I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. People are going to say it's too difficult. And in fact, what did the Meraglim say? What did the Meraglim say? Lo nucha lalos. We can't they, they, their, simple and their simple thing was, the land is great. land is great. We can't do it. It's too difficult. It's simply too difficult. So Moshe Rabbeinu says, Yoshua, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. Sometimes when you're close to actualizing your destiny, that's when things become hardest and when you're most tempted to give up. So I'm going to give you chizik. I'm going to give you the yud of Sarai. The Yud of Sarai, which represents an unbridled commitment to your destiny, an unbridled commitment to a vision. The Yud of Sarai, which represents when you don't let, don't let anything derail you. If you believe that it's good and you believe that it's true and you believe that it's worth making happening, worth making happen, then no matter what the adversity is, you need to study yourself. You need to go ahead and entrench yourself and you need to establish your staying power. I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to make this happen. He takes the Yod from Sarai who personified this idea and gives it to Hosea. Yoshua, if you want to lead them into Eretz Yisrael, you have to be Sarai-like in your resolve and your commitment to the things you want out of life. And now coming full circle, with this will conclude, coming full circle, this is what David HaMelech was saying in the opening phrase of this capital. David HaMelech says, according to the Medrash, Mizmar the Asaf, Ach tov li Yisrael akim levare leva. Remember again, what did the Medrash say? Suffering has an incredible power. What's the power of suffering? Suffering goes ahead and clarifies your resolve. Suffering ultimately, again, tells you what you want or what you should want, right? Suffering, as we said before, has the ability to clarify or strengthen your resolve. Talmud says there's a beauty, and this might sound strange, but there's a beauty in adversity. And the beauty in adversity tells you, adversity tells you what are the things you say you want out of life and what are the things you really want out of life. How do you tell adversity seen those two things? In the midst of suffering and after suffering, what are you still clinging on to and what have you let go of? The things you let go of, to be honest, those are things you say you want out of life, 
but maybe are not really willing to put in the work. But the things you hold on to, those are your Sarai things. Those are your Yehoshua things. Those are your Yud life objectives that you say are so important to me that I am not going to let them go no matter what. And I think that the lesson of David HaMelech is so profoundly important in our lives. I think for many of us, you know, as we kind of become a little bit retrospective, as we get older and have a little bit more of life behind us, I think we think about the things that we've let go of, right? The things that I said I really wanted out of life and I just stopped wanting them or I stopped trying for them or I just let go of them. Now, sometimes that's for good reason. Sometimes because as we get older, we recognize that the things we wanted when we were young are not important. So some of that is just maturity. But a lot of times in life, we just, there are things that I want, I wanted so badly, but then there were hiccups, then there were bumps in the road, then there were valleys, then there were difficulties, and I let go of them. I let go of them. So first of all, no matter what you let go of, you can always reclaim it. That's, that's the first thing. But to really think about, almost like to take out our, our personal life diary and to write down, what are the things that I hold on to in life? What are the things that are the pillars of my persona, the pillars of my ruchnias, the pillars of my Yiddishkeit, the things that are important to me? And am I willing to hold on to those things no matter what happens in life? When things get tough, and they get tough for all of us in different ways, do I still hold on to those things? Or ultimately, again, I do them when it's convenient, but when it's not convenient or when life is difficult, I let go of them. We could tell a lot about ourselves by the kind of people we are, not during times of happiness, shalom and bracha, but during times of incredible adversity. That's what David HaMelech was saying. That's what Sarah Imenu was teaching us. And that's what Moshe was trying to teach Yoshua. If you want, truly want something out of life, whatever that something is, we all have our own somethings, whether it's in Gashmius or whether it's in Ruchmius, whatever it is, if you want something out of life, that means a willingness to grab hold of it and to not let go. No matter what happens in life, good times, difficult times, suffering, celebration, whatever it is, if you want it, you can only cling to really want it if you hold on to it no matter what. So if there are things that we've let go of and we want to reclaim, Tuesday night is a great time to start reclaiming the things you've lost in life. But I think more importantly, looking forward, looking forward, you know, Thursday nights we're learning the Sefer Tzav it's the, it's the it's the diary, the spiritual diary of the Piazetzna. Very powerful to see the power of writing things down and the power of keeping a spiritual diary. And what an incredible, powerful avod it could be to write down what are the things you want out of life. Really, like, I, and by the way, I don't mean just like, you know, I want to finish Sefer Tehillim four times in an hour. Like, like you know, there is like, like, like realistic things that I really want out of life. Like who I want to be, the kind of person I want to be. It could be what you want out of your career. It could be the kind of family you want to create. It could be the kind of person you want to be. Whatever, whatever, whatever it is, whatever it is, the kind of davening you want to have. Write it down. Write it down. Identify what are your Sarai goals. What are your davening? What are your goals? What are the things you want? But just understand, if you're putting it on there and you want it, that means that no matter how difficult things become, you pledge to hold on to it. That's the true litmus test. Because if life becomes difficult and I let go of it, I didn't really want it. But if when life becomes difficult, I still hold on to it, then I'm a Davin HaMelech. Then I'm a Sarai Imenu. Then I am a Yoshua. So Halavai, that same Yud, that same Yud that started with Sarai, went to Yoshua, went to David, and has, that Yud has visited so many great people throughout the generations. That Yod Shedem Yerat HaShem nestle itself between the letters of our names as well and should give us the power to hold on to the things we want out of life, both in times of bracha as well as times of adversity. All right, we'll stop over here for tonight. We'll continue Yerat HaShem in Kapital, Ayin Gimel, 73, one more week. Shkoyach, everyone. Sorry for the location change, but uh, all right, of course.